Uh, good evening, my name is Dr. Paul Stanislaw. I am a facial plastic surgeon um, in Avon, Connecticut. Uh, I am board certified in facial plastic surgery and I've been in practice for 22 years uh, doing facial plastic surgery. And tonight we're gonna talk about all about facelifts or everything you need to know about facelifts. Um, I'm doing this simultaneously on Instagram and also Facebook. Um, so if anyone has any questions, just type in the questions and I will um, try to answer all the questions as they come in. And for this forum, it really does help if you guys ask questions. Uh, so tonight we're gonna talk about facelifts. Uh, the first thing um, that people need to know about facelifts is that there really is no standard nomenclature. Like people come in all the time and they'll tell me, uh, I want a full facelift. And I'm like, mm, I don't know what a full facelift is. Uh, so we're gonna just talk about the names for facelifts so that you can actually compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So when people talk about a full facelift, they're, um, what I'm assuming they're talking about is they're talking about a forehead lift and a brow lift, potentially upper eyelid surgery, lower eyelid surgery, facelift, and a neck lift. Now, in my mind, that gets very confusing if you're trying to talk about all those different procedures because each procedure has a different focus, has a different goal, and it's better to be very specific and goal-oriented. So what I tell patients is, like, what is it that you, what is it that you see that bugs you, okay? Um, and when you are, uh, like if you're focused, oh, I hate my neck, or I hate my jowls, or I hate my brows, they're all different procedures, okay? So starting off with brows, a brow lift is basically when, as we get older, our brows start to sag, and as this sags down, if we want to lift that up, it's a very subtle lift and that's a brow lift. If people have concerns about their upper eyelid skin, then that's an upper blepharoplasty. If they're concerned about the bulges under their, low, their lower eyelids, which is down here, that's a lower blepharoplasty. If they're concerned about their lower jawline, so their jowls, marionette lines, their jawline, this is a facelift. Okay, a facelift addresses the lower third of the face. It's not up here, it's not the eyes. Um, when people can come in about a neck, they'll say, oh, I'm here for a neck lift, I want a neck lift. The um, issue about neck lifts is that there's no such thing as a neck lift by itself. All right, a neck lift is always with a facelift and a facelift is always with a neck lift and you really can't unbundle the two of them. And the reason behind that or why is because we age going south. All this, as this deflates, the skin loses its elasticity, this sags down. And when we're doing a facelift neck lift, we're trying to lift all of this back up in the direction that it's sagged. We didn't sag this way. So the only way to do a neck lift, or well, there's two ways really to do a neck lift, would be to make incisions under here, which would scar very, very poorly. And that doesn't heal well, that doesn't look nice with the scars. And the other way is to put incisions way back here in the back of the head at the nape of the neck, the problem with doing that and pulling this back is we did not age this way. Again, we age this way and you start pulling it this way. So much tension will be on your neck that every time you turn your head, it's gonna pull on those scars and it's gonna cause these scars to widen. And if you do that and those scars widen, you will always have to have your hair up. You can now have short hair, you can't put your hair up in a ponytail because those scars are really, really noticeable. So the only way to do a neck is to lift this up this way. So if I'm trying to make the neck better, the jowl's in the way, I'm automatically gonna make the jawline and the jowl better because it's in the way. If I'm trying to make the jowl better, as I lift this up, it's gonna pull the neck up. So um, again, forehead lift or brow lift, upper eyelid blepharoplasty, lower blepharoplasty, facelift and neck lift. When I talk to patients, when I say facelift, I tell them, a facelift automatically includes a neck lift. So in my terminology from now going forward, when I say a facelift, it's gonna say, it's gonna mean facelift and a neck lift. Now, the next thing about terminology is that there's 10,000 terms of facelifts. Like there's mini facelifts, there's weekend facelifts. There are um, facelifts named after people, like, oh, this is a Stanislaw facelift. Uh, there's what's called a SMAS facelift, and then there's what's called a deep plane facelift. Um, just to let you know, I do a deep plane facelift just because I think it's, uh, looks much more natural. It's 
much more longer lasting and it's much more powerful. Um, and we'll get into that. But a weekend facelift or mini facelift to me is just sort of a marketing term. It's to get people in. Oh, I don't like this and I just want, I don't have any downtime. Well, for a weekend facelift or a mini facelift, what they're doing is they're just putting a little incision in here. They're taking the skin, they're pulling on the skin, and they're cutting that skin out right there. And all the tension is on the skin incision itself. That is not, doesn't achieve much, doesn't fix the neck, really doesn't pull on the jowls, and we'll talk about why it doesn't move this, because these are all anchored down. But a weekend facelift, mini facelift, I don't do them. I just think that it's just a marketing ploy. Um, then there is, like, all the name ones, I'm not even going to go into them. It's just to make people sound like they're, you know, invented something really cool. And then there's smash facelift. So a smash facelift has been sort of the main one for most of the, for many, many years. And for a smash facelift, you go out to about here and you free things up and then you lift this up and you make this incision that goes under the sideburn in front of the ear and side of here and back here. Um, I did that for the first 10 years of my practice. Uh, that's the way I was trained, but I felt that it didn't last very long. It wasn't uh, a very powerful, especially when you had heavy necks, necks that were really hanging down and you really needed to get a lift you weren't, by just only going out to here, you weren't getting uh, much lift. Um, still very popular facelift, done very often, but again, I don't do those anymore. I do a, a deep plane facelift. So the, for the past 10 years or so, um, I've been doing a deep plane facelift. And so what is a deep plane facelift? All a deep plane facelift means is that, um, I'm gonna, well, I guess I have to digress a little bit into what's going on before I go into that. But a deep plane facelift really goes out further, frees up all the anchors that are holding this, preventing this from moving, and there you can lift this up without tension, uh, without it causing it to swirl, and um, it looks just much, much more natural, and it is much more powerful. So to better understand why I do a deep plane facelift, I'm gonna go into the anatomy, why, what is aging, right? Um, people come in all the time saying, oh, I look older. Well, what, what does that mean? There's just so many different components of the aging process, um, and each component has a different treatment option. And unless you understand all the treatment options, um, you really, well, unless you understand all the components of the aging process, you really don't understand the treatment options. So we're going to go over the whole aging process. Um, can you get facelift after Ulthera? So quick question I just got was, can you get a facelift after Ulthera on face? Yes, you can. Um, it doesn't limit that from happening. Uh, I guess it depends on the time frame too. I mean, I wouldn't go have Ulthera and then just have a facelift right afterwards. You'd want to have some healing time in between that. Um, but uh, the um, uh, there's no, if you've had it in the past, there's no reason why you can't have a facelift later. The, um, so from the aging process, the first thing is the skin itself, okay? As we get older, <clears throat> our skin loses its, el its elasticity. When we're young, it's like a rubber band. It stretches and it contracts. It maintains its shape like a rubber band. And as we age, the skin loses its elasticity. Now, the interesting thing about elasticity is that when you're born, 4% of your skin's elastin protein, and that's the protein that allows it to stretch. After... As time goes by, after you're born, you never grow elasticity again. There's no, there's no, I don't care what anybody says, there's no magic machine, there's no magic cream, there's no magic laser that's gonna make you elastic again. So you'll hold on to elasticity sort of to a certain genetically determined point and then it'll sort of drop off. So that, that rubber band is getting stretched out and eventually it kind of breaks. So this skin container when we're young is nice and tight and your neck, you turn your head, the skin would stretch, you'd come back, it would contract, it'd maintain its shape. As we get older, it loses its elasticity. So you come back, it doesn't contract anymore. It just sort of sags there. So what I tell people is that that skin container is a little bit bigger than it used to be. The next thing that happens is we lose fat in the face. Okay, so there's three different, real three different types of fat. There's the fat that occurs, it gives bulges under the eyes, right? And that fat is what I call metabolically stable. You could gain 100 pounds, it's not gonna grow. You can lose 100 pounds, it's not going away. The fat of our face is metabolically destined to atrophy. It's gonna shrink. It's gonna start to dissolve as we get older. And you'll see that in your temples, in your forehead, 
in the pre-gel area, you'll start to lose that, that blanket of fat. Um, and so we're losing volume there. The fat of our belly is different. Our fat of our belly always is metabolically active. It always wants to grow. And this fat is different than this fat and it's different than the fat under our eyes. And there's a question. Is there any procedure you do, you do not recommend to be done prior to a facelift or a facelift will no longer be an option? Um, there's nothing that you really can't do before a facelift um, that limits you from having a facelift later. Uh, there are some like surgeries, like so if someone had a radiation therapy to their, they, they had a cancer in their mouth or something like that, and they had radiation therapy, or they had some sort of cancer resection, that would limit that. Um, you don't also wanna do filler right before having a facelift, because a lot of times that filler will swell, it'll stay, your face will stay swollen longer, but otherwise there's really nothing you can't do uh, before a facelift. But as we get older, we're gonna lose that fat and it's gonna be less volume. Now, the next thing that happens is we lose bone mass. Now, as we get older, we get shorter. It's osteoporosis, we start to shrink. That same osteoporosis, that same process happens to our facial skeleton. Our facial bones dissolve front to back, up and down, side to side. The whole facial skeleton is gonna involute like a shrunken head, okay? So as that dissolves in, there's again, less volume there. Now what's really, really bizarre is that that process is asymmetric. One cheekbone will dissolve more than the other. One bony orbital rim, rim will dissolve more than the other. So people will come in, well, part of getting older is becoming asymmetric and it's because that muscle, that bony skeleton dissolves as we get older. So like for an eyebrow, people have pictures of themselves when they were 30 and their eyebrows are perfectly symmetric and as they get older, one eyebrow drops and one eyebrow still high. And there's many causes of that, but one of the most common causes is that this bony rim, the shelf that's holding up the eyebrow, starts to dissolve backwards and that eyebrow will drop. So people come in all the time and say, this eye looks worse than this eye, this smile line is worse than this smile line. And that's because of asymmetric bone loss in the face. Um, the other interesting thing with that is that there are anchors that attach the skin to the bone or to the structures underneath. And so as that bone dissolves in, these anchors will pull in. So every place where you have a wrinkle, here, the tear troughs, the smile lines, the marionette lines, as this bone dissolves, this anchor will pull in. This cheek, which used to be fuller with fat, have more bone and have a tighter elastic skin, is deflated, stretched out, it sags with gravity, it hits where it's tethered and rolls over and pooches out here. This bone dissolves in, this gets deeper, this falls, it hits where it's tethered, and it rolls over. So there's the loss of elasticity, loss of fat, loss of bone, and then there's gravitational changes that all this sags down. So each one of those components has a different treatment option, right? So if I have volume loss, if I've got fat loss here, I can just put filler in there and mimic the fat and sculpt that out. If I have deep smile lines, okay, smile lines, you can put filler in there and spackle that out. But when it comes to the jowl sagging down and the neck, neck sagging down, that once you tell me that my neck sags down, it's surgery or nothing. There is no other option and we're gonna go into why that is the case. Um, so the last thing to understand the whole aging process is that when we are young, our face is round, okay? Um, so when we're in our 20s, our face is around, we have all that baby fat. And then when we're 30, our face is more like an upside down triangle, right? So we love our cheekbones and everybody likes that. Oh, when I was 30, that was just, that was the best. And then as we age, this all starts to sag down and falls out like a waterfall. So these jowls start to go. So we end up with a face that's more like an up, like a regular triangle. So the only thing that moves this back up to this, takes this. So this used to be up here, this sags down. The only thing that lifts this, that does this, is surgery. So when we talk about, um, hang on for a second, subject is so overwhelming, thank you for trying to guide me this, uh, okay. So, um, all right, another question, do you do facelifts on men? If so, is it done the same way? Uh, so that's a good question. 
you do, we do facelifts on men and women. Uh, the number of men getting facelifts is definitely increasing as, as times change. Um, there is a difference in how facelifts are done for men for women. For women, um, the incision goes in front of the ear. It goes inside of this nubbin of cartilage. It goes down here, goes back here and here. Uh, for a deep plane facelift, the incision also goes in front of the sideburn. It's different from a man because you have to make the incision in front of this nub and a cartilage, it's this tra called the tragus, it's right here, right? So you have to do the incision there. The reason you have to do it there is because if you lift this up and the incision's behind there, you're gonna pull hair onto the tragus and they'd have to shave the tragus or you'd have to laser resurface that, or uh, do laser hair removal to get rid of that. So um, you're gonna, so for men, the incision's a little bit different. Uh, also the downtime's a little bit different because in general, men have shorter hair and their downtime's longer. Women who have longer hair, they can pull their hair over and they can get out uh, actually quicker. Um, how long after a facelift can I go back to work? All right, so for uh, a woman who has longer hair, I generally tell people about two weeks. Um, it depends on what work is. So if work requires you to do a lot of bending, lifting and straining, a lot of turning your neck, you're gonna wanna do that a little bit longer because um, that sort of, uh, undoes what I do. Like if you if you start whipping your head around right after the surgery, we, we need this to heal in place. So if you're not doing that type of work where you're bending with your straining, uh, for a woman, I usually sell say two weeks because they can pull their hair down. For a man, I tell them it's about a month because uh, men usually have shorter hair. And the rate limiting step for um, men is that when you do these incisions around here, there's gonna be a little swelling right under the sideburn, a little puffiness, right? through here and that takes about four to six weeks to settle down so if it's a man he can grow a beard and hide it right if you're used to having a beard um, but that that swelling there takes about four to six weeks to settle down and so you know if your hair is longer you can do it um, if you got short hair it's more like four weeks that it takes um, for the uh, swelling to settle down so um, so from a deep plane facelift standpoint, um, when you're doing a deep plane, you're really gonna go all the way out here and all the way through here. And the reason being is because the, the why a deep plane is more powerful and it's more natural looking is that remember I talked about the anchors that are holding the structures in and as the bone dissolves, it pulls this in. Well, those anchors are preventing this from moving. So if I have a big anchor right here in the middle of my cheek, and I have jowls in my neck, and I wanna make my incision here and lift this up, if I have an anchor here, no matter how hard I pull, I'm pulling against that anchor. It's not allowing any of this thing, any of this to move. So when you're doing a deep plane facelift, um, what you're doing is you're getting underneath of um, the, the structures there, the skin, the fat, and the muscle. You're freeing up the anchors so that this sandwich, this, this, this can move up freely without tension. Um, and so that's the key to it all. It's basically, uh, as this area sags, um, there's a layer of muscle, a layer of fat, a layer of skin, and this sags down. And as that sags down, you start to see the bands that are here. Um, and those bands are the muscle, it's called the platysma muscle. It's a thin sheet of a muscle here and a thin sheet of a muscle here. And we're young, it's tucked up high underneath of our neck. And as we age, it starts to sag down. And as it sags down, you're seeing those muscles on end. So that muscle, above that muscle is a layer of fat, and above that is the skin. And as that sags down, because of deflation, it makes it look like there's a lot more fat there and a lot more skin there. So what a deep plane facelift is doing is you're getting underneath of that sandwich of muscle, fat, and skin. You're freeing up the anchors, and then you can redrape this more naturally without having swirls getting a more powerful lift to the neck and also making this uh, last a lot, lot longer. Um, questions, uh, is there anything we should do to prep for skin or surgery for skin care? My paternity appeals and for the, for the boosters. Um, so the question is, uh, what can we do to prep our skin before and after? Um, again, from a um, taking care of your skin um, and also before and after, the better you are with a sunblock with zinc oxide, 
Um, I really don't care about SPF numbers so much. I really, it's about the, the um, zinc oxide that's the important thing, the ingredient you want it micronized where it goes unclear because zinc oxide blocks both UVA and UVB. That's the most cost-effective thing to slow down the aging process. Um, there's vitamin, topical vitamin A, topical vitamin C, and topical vitamin E. All those are antioxidants. They make you hold on to your elasticity for longer. So remember I talked about losing elasticity and the skin container being stretched out. The better you are with your sunblock, the retin-A, vitamin C, and E, the better you'll maintain your elasticity, the better you will age. Um, nothing grows the elasticity, nothing makes you elastic again. So the better you are at maintaining your elasticity, the better um, you will age. That's true for before the surgery and it's true for after the surgery. So if you're having a facelift and you're doing all this stuff and you wanna maintain your results, well, you wanna take care of your skin and you wanna make your skin to maintain its elasticity for as long as you can. Um, so uh, a, qu a question that people always ask me, and while we're on this, we'll talk about this, is how long does a facelift last, right? Is this, you know, 10 years, five years? Um, the thing with facelifts is that it really, what makes it, how long a facelift lasts depends on how you're going to continue to age. So um, I told you that you're gonna lose fat in your face, you're gonna lose bone mass in your face. And when we're young, you know, when we're in our 30s, or 40s, or 50s, that aging process, that loss of volume, that loss of skin elasticity is kind of linear. It just sort of chugs, chugs along. As we get older and we go through hormonal changes and other th events that occur in our lives, um, that bone loss, that fat loss starts to escalate. It starts to become logarithmic. We start to lose it faster. So we age faster as we get older. And so depending on where you are in that age range, right? So if you're younger, you're gonna hold on to those structures longer, the facelift's gonna last longer. If you're older, it's not gonna last as long. And I can't control how you hold on to your, the fat of your face, and I can't control how you hold on to the bone mass of your face. What you can control is how you lose your elasticity. So it doesn't sound like much. Ah, oh, all I can do is like these creams. Yeah, that's as good as we get. You know, the better you are about maintaining your elasticity, the better you're keeping that container as a rubber band, the better your facelift is going to last. Um, and the way I sort of explain the whole volume loss thing is, so say I do a facelift on someone who's overweight and I have a volume because they're kind of overweight and I lift up their skin around that volume. I pull it as tight as I can. And after the facelift, those people go on a diet and they lose say 40 pounds or 60 pounds. As they lose that fat, they're gonna deflate. They're gonna come back to me six months later and say, look, I lost this weight. Now look, I'm, it, it didn't last. My face looked less. Well, it's because I can only pull you so tight around a given volume, you lost that weight, it's gonna deflate. So the next key thing is, is if you're gonna have a facelift or a neck lift, you wanna be your ideal body weight when you do it. Um, I can't stress that enough. And unfortunately, uh, life doesn't allow us to lose that weight. It's, like it's stressful, it's work, it's this, that, and the other thing. Um, but I can't, uh, it's really much better if you're your ideal body weight when you do the facelift. Um, so I tell people, you know, that's the goal. And a lot of times people will say, all right, I'm gonna try, um, and uh, I'm gonna try to do, uh, lose the weight. And sometimes they can't, and sometimes uh, this is about as good as it's gonna get. And we still do the facelift, of course. Um, but again, if you're thinking about losing weight, you want to do that before the surgery. Um, if I want a full facelift, can I? All right. Um, so uh, I'll address that actually later. Um, so when you're doing a uh, facelift, um, when I ask people like, what are their concerns? What is it that you see? You know, what the, is it that bugs you? and we try to focus on what those things are. So if someone comes in and they say to me, I hate my neck, right? I hate my neck. And I saw somewhere that I can do injections in there and, design, and make my neck better and make it like this. Or I can do this machine and it's gonna tighten up all my skin like a, like a facelift would or a neck lift will. That is not true. I do not think those are cost-effective good things to do. Uh, the reason being is because Getting back to what's going on as, as we age, the sandwich of muscle, fat, and skin sags down. 
And as it sags down, it makes it look like there's a lot more fat and there's a lot more skin. So say I dissolve the fat, right? So I inject some medicine in there, I dissolve all that fat. Well, what's gonna happen? It's not doing anything to the skin. So I've got a skin envelope that's now deflated and now it's you're changing, you're getting rid of the fat, but now it's like a wrinkly deflated balloon. So patients will come in and say, oh, look, I'm all wrinkly here now. Look, all these wrinkles. And I'll say, oh, look, look, you're, now your neck is like this when it was like this. You don't ever want to trade off the front view for the side view, okay? People, they, like, they don't, people don't understand this. Like, oh, I just hate this. I hate this. I'll do anything. I don't care if I'm wrinkly in the front. You do care if you're wrinkly in the front. If I deflate, if I deflate all this fat with either a machine or liposuction or a, an injection and I get rid of all the fat, you're gonna look wrinklier here because I haven't addressed the skin envelope. The other consequence of that is that fat that's here is hiding those two bands a lot. There's those two muscles that are sagging down that sags and you've got that fat that's over that. If you inject or you suck out that fat, now you're gonna see those bands more. So you're getting rid of, rid of that blanket that's hiding those sort of um, contour irregularities. After facelift, do you need to add fillers for fat loss in cheeks? Um, so I'm gonna digress for, uh, I'll get to that in just one second. Um, the, so when you're doing the neck, um, you have to address all three components. So now the next thing, oh, I'm gonna do this laser or this machine that's gonna tighten up my skin. Well, in reality, if I've got fat here, I've got two muscles sagging down, how am I gonna cook this enough to shrink wrap this to pull all of this up? You cannot. This skin of the neck is very, very sensitive. So you can laser the face, you can chemical peel the face. This facial skin is very tough. It can handle resurfacing procedures. The neck skin is not. It's very dry, doesn't have the same sebaceous activity, very thin. If you try to laser the neck the same way you do the face, you're gonna scar, right? So all the treatments for the neck to tighten up that skin are so dialed back that they don't do a whole hell of a lot. They're very, they're not cost effective. And they're not addressing the fat and they're not addressing the muscles that's sagging down. So the results with those are really kind of limited. And unfortunately, I see a fair number of people who spend a lot of money on that type of stuff and they end up with scars down here. Um, and they're like, oh, I want to do a facelift now. Well, if you have scars down here and I go to try to do a facelift, I potentially might move that scar because it's so saggy up onto your cheek. So prior, someone asked me, are there procedures that you can't do before a facelift? Well, if you've done all sorts of resurfacing procedures down here and you've scarred this area, I might not be able to do a facelift because if I lift that skin up, I might move that scar up onto your cheek and make it more noticeable. So that that is one thing that I didn't think about earlier. Um, and then the last thing is the bands, right? Those muscles that are sagging down. There's no laser that's gonna move them up. There's no suction or dissolving that's gonna make that move up. So the only thing that's gonna move those bands up is surgery. So the only thing that addresses the skin, the fat, and the muscle, lifts this up, is a facelift, neck lift, and again. So the question that I've got, and it's an excellent question, is after facelift, do you need to add fillers for fat loss in cheeks? And that is, it depends on the person. So when you're doing a facelift, you're taking all of this and you're lifting this vertically. It's sort of like a rotational event. You're sort of bringing this up. You're not pulling this way. Like people come in all the time and say, look, oh, look, if I just do this, look how good I look. You look really stupid like this. When you pull this way and you pull this flat, your cheeks were never flat when you were younger. Your cheeks were curved, they had a gentle curvature. They were all highlight, there was no shadows, okay? They weren't flat. So when people come and say, oh, I wanna do this, I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, you really don't. You wanna keep this, um, that same gentle convexity, that same gentle highlight with no shadows. So some people will have a lot of volume loss in here. They'll have lots and lots of uh, like a deep depression here. And when you do a deep plane facelift, you do repurpose this fat. So this used to be up here, this sags down. You're moving this up and you're repurposing it but you really can't get this fat into here. There's just no way to lift this in here. So 
when people have these deep depressions, what I tell people is, or they have a lot of volume loss, what I tell people is we're gonna do that facelift first, we're gonna move this up, we're gonna get this as good as we can, we're gonna let three months go by, let all the swelling and everything settle down, and then we're gonna look at it. And you might look at it and say, ah, you know what, this is better, this is softer, I'm cool, I'm happy, this is nice, my jowl's better, my marionette line's better, this, my neck's better. I don't see this so much. You might, though, come back in three months and say, yeah, this is all good, but you know what, I still see this stupid shadow, I still see this hollow. Well, then I will come back and I'll put filler in there, but I can use a lot less filler to do it after the surgery than before the surgery, okay? So I can just do a little bit of sculpting and do that. So when it comes to that type of finesse filler stuff, um, it's always better to do the filler after the surgery than before the surgery because if you do it before, you tend up using more filler, it's more expensive. The other reason is, is that if you do filler first and you do the facelift longer, most fillers, like the Juvederms and the Restylane's, are sponges. They hold down to a thousand times their weight in water and they'll swell. So if you have a lot of filler here first before the facelift, your post-op period will be longer because you'll be swollen for longer. And the last thing is that when you do these facelifts, if you've had filler here in the past and you move this, it might move the filler and I might have to dissolve the filler later and erase it if it moves when you do the facelift. Um, the other thing that I tell people is that when it comes to this area, all right, there is no surgery that fixes this. There's mid facelifts, they suck, don't even bother. The only way to recreate that same gentle convexity, that same soft uh, highlight is with fillers. Now, that's true for the smile lines too. So if you said to me, I don't care about my neck, I don't care about my jowls, I just hate my smile lines, a facelift is not gonna pull that out because you're gonna look really kind of stupid. The best way to just do smile lines is just to do filler because what you're doing is you're getting under that anchor, you're using that cannula to pry up that, that, that um, anchor and you're filling it to sort of mimic the bone and you're lifting that up. Quick digression, um, I don't like doing filler out here. You'll see tons of people where they do filler out here and they say, ooh, I like my high cheekbones. This is not high cheekbones. These are wide cheekbones. When we were younger, we never had wide cheekbones. We had, when we were younger, we had cheekbones that came up under our eyes. They were a foundation. They supported our eyes. They gave this a nice gentle highlight, but it was high cheekbones or cheekbones that support the eyes, that frame the eyes. It's not out here. So all these people that do all this filler out here, it looks weird, right? Um, and what happens with that, and I'm gonna, again, uh, go back to the jowls, right? I just, I said earlier, the only thing that lifts these jowls up and repositions that is surgery. There is no non-surgical way to move that up. Um, but people are told, oh, well, I'm gonna put, we can, uh, you know what? I, I, a patient comes in and says, I don't wanna do a facelift. Uh, I hate my jowls. Can we put, I saw somewhere where I can put filler up here and it's gonna lift my jowls. And that is not reality, okay? So if this was up here and this is fallen, okay? Um, I start putting filler up here. What's gonna happen? Well, think of the skin. I told you the skin is a spring. It wants to stretch and contract. And think of, this jowl is like a brick. So if I have a brick and I have a spring, I put a spring to the brick. If I want to make the brick move, I have to stretch the spring beyond its elastic component before the brick will move. If this is the jowl, this is the brick, and this is the spring, as I fill this, this cheek, what's going to happen? This cheek's going to swell and swell and swell until it can't swell any, it, until it's so distended, so stretched out before anything will move. And so by definition, you will have more volume in your cheeks than you ever had when you were younger. So when you see all these people with big, fat, stupid cheeks, the way that goes is, oh, I don't wanna do the facelift, I don't wanna look well pulled and stuff, oh, let's just do filler, but then they get all distorted. Um, the other way I explain that too is, if this jowl was up here and this has fallen, say I have a box and the box is on a shelf, right, or on a, on a table, the box, falls to the floor. How does stacking more stuff on top of that box move that box up here? Because essentially you're putting filler up here. 
it's stacking on top of that gel. It's not letting that gel move. So getting back to the whole faces like this when we're 20 and we're like this when we're 30 and we're like this when we're 60, what are they doing when they're putting filler into the cheeks to make the jowls go away? Well, they're not lifting the gel. What they're doing is they're blowing the cheek out wider and wider and wider. So by relationship, now the cheek is wider than the jowl like this, but now you're all distorted. Um, so again, I'm not, I don't like putting fillers out here into the cheeks. This is not a, uh, these are not high cheekbones. This is high cheekbones, cheekbones that frame the eyes. Um, so yes, very commonly after I do a facelift neck lift, I will do filler under the eyes into this area to, or even like some areas like here, if this gets really, really hollow, no matter how hard you pull, there's still a hollow there. And sometimes you have to put a little filler in there to spackle out that um, depression. Okay, what is the scarring like? Would people know? All right, so the scarring, so the question is, what is the scarring like and would people know? So the goal of this is to make these scars hide as best we can, all right? So there's always gonna be scars. There's no way to do a facelift without having a scar. So first incision is a little incision that goes under the chin. It's about a half inch that goes right under here. Um, that heals up beautifully. That heals really, really well. You're never really gonna see that. Um, so that's it, one little incision there. For a deep plane facelift, the incision is gonna go in front of the sideburn, under the sideburn, in this crease, inside the nub and a cartilage here. I don't know if you guys can see that. In front of the earlobe, up inside here, and back into the hairline. All these incisions, this incision, this incision, all this hides really, really very well, okay? Just because of the hair and because you're irregularizing it, you're sort of following normal wrinkles, those hide really well. This incision in front of the side of burn, that doesn't hide so well. Unfortunately, you have to make this incision because a deep plane facelift lifts in this direction, okay? So as you lift this, and if you don't, if you lift it and you don't make the incision, it bunches up right here, right? So to prevent it from bunching up, you have to make the incision in front of the hairline. If you don't make the incision in front of the hairline, as you lift this up, it's gonna screw up your hairline. You'll never be able, be able to wear your hair short. You'll never be able to wear your hair up because this whole sideburn will move. So you have to make the incision around the hair. Now, this incision, right, for me, it takes me 30 to 45 minutes just to sew this incision here and then another 30 to 45 minutes just to sew this incision here. This incision, it's like a billion little, little tiny stitches with a lot of delicate and a really meticulous to make that heal up as well as we can to make that hide. So the goal, again, you're always gonna have in scars, is to make these incisions hide as best as you can. And like, I don't use staples. Staples heal horribly. I don't put three stitches in here because it heals horribly. It's all, it's attention to detail and it's taking your time to make, to sew these up and to make this well. Again, for a man, this incision is gonna go in front of this tragus, but if you look really closely, this has got a little curved line to it. And so when I do the facelift for a man, I'm gonna make that incision a little curved and irregularized. It's not a straight line. So again, that hides really well as, as well, but it takes longer to make these incisions look nice. And, that, and, and people just have to realize that it takes time um, you know, people come to me and say, oh, you can do this in an hour or two hours. There's no way for me to do this facelift in two hours, right? What I tell people is, you're paying me to take my time to make this look as good as I can. And honestly, if it was my facelift, there's no way I'd want someone to do that surgery in two hours, right? Um, the faster you are, you're taking shortcuts. You're not, your attention is not to the details. You're not making this look as nice. And you're at risk for more bleeding and nerve injuries and all sorts of stuff if you race. So you want to take your time. Um, will my hairdresser know I've had a lower facelift when she does my hair? Um, yeah. Uh, and they are really, really good judges of this because they see it all. Hairdressers see. So the question is, will my hairdresser know? Hairdressers see it all. They know it all. Um, and they are really, really good judges of this. So, because they're in there and they're going to see all this type of stuff. And, you know, if my incisions pass that hairdresser test, 
then I know I'm doing a good job. Um, and that's the goal. The goal is to make this hide so well that people aren't going to be able to tell. Uh, I'll tell a, a little digression on a story. So I had a patient once where I did a facelift neck lift and she's, I see her back at her three month post-op visit and she is just ecstatic. She's like super happy. She, so she tells me the story where she's having dinner with a friend and a friend is looking at her and she's like, you had a facelift, you had a facelift. And a friend goes up to her and pulls her hair up because they they must've been really, really close. So like no boundaries here. Pulls her hair up and looks at her and says, she looks around here. And she looks and she's looking right at her and she's like, oh, you didn't have a facelift, there's no scars. So, and that woman was ecstatic. She's like, my friend came up, pulled my hair. She thinks I had a, she says I had a facelift and she looks and there's no, there's no, she can't see any scars and she's looking dead on. That's what the goal is, okay? Um, so it can be done. You don't have to have wide scars. Um, and so it just has to do with the attention to detail. Um, but yeah, even hairdressers. So when I do a facelift, so a good, a question that's often really super important that I get all the time is, when can I get my hair done, right? And the answer to that is, I want you to wait after the one month visit before you get your hair done. So if you get your hair colored or anything like that, or permed or anything, you're gonna do that the week before the facelift because I'm gonna make you wait a whole month before you can have that done. And there's a couple reasons for that. First reason is, I wanna make sure all of these incisions are all healed well before you stick your head into the sink and have all these bacteria in that sink get in those incisions or chemicals on my incisions. So I wanna make sure all the incisions are healed well before you start putting chemicals on those incisions. And I also wanna um, make sure that, um, that you're not, when you tilt your head back, that you're not putting a lot of stress on my incisions. So I want a month to go by before you get your hair done. So that, um, you're gonna to wanna to wait a month um, before you have your hair done. Um, okay, so, uh, how many hours and is it local okay? Okay, so the question is, is how many hours is a facelift and is local okay? So when I do a facelift, it takes me five, five and a half hours. Um, and that sounds like a lot of time. But in reality, I can't do it any faster. I don't want to do it any faster. I take my time. Um, if I just said that it takes me 30 minutes to 45 minutes just to sew from here to here, Okay, that's an hour to an hour and a half out of that five and a half hours, okay? So it's not like I'm doing open heart surgery. It's not like I'm doing brain surgery. It is just being meticulous in sewing this. So I have to sew here, I have to sew here, I have to sew here and all these stitches. It takes a lot of time to sew that really very nicely. Um, you can't rush that. So it takes me five, and five, five and a half hours. Now. And the question of local, 98% um, of my facelifts I do in the office under local anesthetic. And that means no IVs, no, no general anesthesia, no sedation, no Valium. It is just me injecting local. Now, the local I use lasts for about eight hours. When that local goes in, it is going to be a pinch and a burn, right? This is what it is. So I'm going to start here. I'm gonna say, all right, I'm gonna inject numbing medication. We inject numbing medication here. It's gonna be a pinch and a burn. It's gonna take kick in. It's gonna be numb for eight hours. I do my work down here. Then I go here and I'm gonna inject numbing medication all around here, right? And it's an ouch, right? But once it's numb, it's numb for eight hours. I do my job, I do my thing. Then I go to this side and I inject local and I do it. Now, 98% of people do that. And why is that? It's because most of my patients don't like anesthesia. They don't how they don't like how it makes it feel, make them feel afterwards. It scares them. It like they're afraid to go have anesthesia, and I get it. I don't. I'm I'm right there with them. Um, they don't want to go to the hospital. They're afraid of infections. They're afraid of a bacterial infection. They're afraid of COVID. Um, and, and so you need to. Um, so most of my patients much rather do it in the office with local. The other thing is that most patients, by the time they do a facelift, they've already had an injection of filler in their face. They've already had Botox, right? So they've already had needles in their face. And I'm like, all right, it's just another needle with local in it. They're like, all right, sign me up. That's awesome. That's good. Um, 
Now, what I tell people though, is you have to be honest with yourself. Not everybody's cool with needles. Um, you have to be like, so if someone's gonna be really, really nervous, just the thought of it makes them wanna vomit. Um, they don't like needles. I tell them, where you're going to sleep. I'm gonna take you to the OR. We're gonna give you general anesthesia. You're gonna be asleep. You're gonna to go to sleep. You're gonna wake up. You're going home that day. There is no, even with a deep plane facelift, there's no staying over. There's no hospital stay. You're going home. Whether I do it in the office or at the hospital, it's the same duration. It's the same amount of local. It is the same results. The only difference is when you're awake and when you're asleep. Okay. Um, so the, so it's very well tolerated. And again, if someone's going to be really, really nervous, I just tell people, let's just go to the hospital. You go home that same day. It's the same results. People often say, all right, well, it's got to be less expensive to do in the office. Yes, that's true. But you can't make the decision based on that because I can't spend five and a half hours talking you off the ceiling. If it's going to be a miserable experience, go to sleep and just wake up and you're done. Um, so it's done in the office of local the majority of the time. And I definitely um, like doing it. So uh, someone asked about lorazepam uh, or for, so oral sedation. Um, I don't prescribe that. I don't give that. Uh, I'm like, you know, if someone already takes value, if someone already takes adamant, someone's very, has anxieties um, and they take it already and their body's used to it, that's cool. You've got it. You're used to it. Your body's used to it. You can take it. No problem. The situation arises though, where people are completely naive. They've never had a Valium. They've never had it. Uh, their girlfriend gives it to them. Oh, you take this. It'll make it blah, blah, blah. So what happens is, is the night before, no one sleeps well. I don't care who you are. Um, you're going to be nervous. You'd have to be insane not to be nervous to have a facelift. You're putting a tremendous amount of trust in me. And I appreciate that. And I understand that. But you, you're always going to be nervous. And my job is just to talk you through it and you'll do fine. So you're up all night long. You haven't slept well. You get in there. Your girlfriend gives you a Valium. You pop that Valium. You've never seen a Valium before. Now I get you into the operating room and we do the local anesthetic and nothing's going on. You don't feel anything and you fall asleep. So most people without a Valium, without a Valium, because they haven't slept before the night before, they fall asleep while I'm doing this, right? They're out cold, they're snoring. Now that Valium kicks in and you're, and I'm like, all right, wake up. Like, cause now Valium suppresses how well you breathe, right? So I tell people no Valium, no Ativan. Um, I will talk you through it. But during the procedure, some people like to talk the entire time and you can talk. You don't have to sit still. You can talk. If you're, um, if you'd rather sleep and be quiet, you can sleep. We play music. You can listen to music. Um, my nurse, uh, Brenda will talk to you. I don't talk too much while I'm doing it. Uh, just because I'm sort of concentrating on what I'm doing, but, uh, the staff will talk to you, uh, while it's going. So everyone's a little bit different but I don't give Valium. The other thing while we're on medications is I do not give narcotics. I haven't given narcotics in, God, probably seven, eight years. Uh, I use a prescription called uh, Celecoxib, which is um, like a Motrin that doesn't affect platelets. It works very, very well. It keeps you on an even keel. Um, doesn't have the GI upsets. You don't have to worry about um, um, uh, addictions or anything like that. So we use just like a special type of prescription Motrin. That's what, that's, that's what we use. Um, now I will tell you that just like the trend for patients is not to go, they don't like anesthesia. Nobody wants to go to the OR. So across the country, more people are doing facelifts in the office, not just me at my office. It's just a trend all the way across. But the other trend is patients don't want to take medications that they don't have to, right? They don't want to take anything. And I am, Completely understand that, and that is, I, I'm all in agreement with that. So the only medication that you have to take after the facelift is the antibiotic. There's no way for me to do this surgery sterilely without shaving your head. Um, so I do give you an antibiotic. You have to take the antibiotic for the week. There's no way you're getting around that. For discomfort, um, I have a lot of patients that don't want to take anything, 
right? So I'll do a facelift on them. The next day they'll come in and they're like, yeah, it aches. Yeah, I know you're there, but it's no big deal. Okay, the vast majority of patients are like that. They're like, eh, it's kind of achy, but I'm fine. I don't want to take the Celebrex the, the, or the, 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 the NSAID. They don't want to even take Tylenol and they don't do that. A lot of patients will just take the Tylenol, um, but it's funny just because the Celebrex or the Celecoxib is a generic name. I'm like, take it. It's, it's there. You can have it. You don't need to worry about it. Um, but um, a lot of patients won't even take that because uh, they don't need to. The discomfort with a facelift, which everybody asks me, like how much discomfort is there? Like I said, in the course of a year, the vast, vast majority of patients will come in and they'll say, yeah, it aches. Yeah, I know. This is the next day. Yeah, it was okay. Uh, I'm fine. They don't even take the, the, the other medications. But people have different pain thresholds, okay? And two patients out of a year, they'll come in, they'll be like, oh, this aches, I'm dying, all this, oh. Two patients out of a whole year. And they have different pain thresholds. It's not that they're wrong. It's not that they're malingering. It's not that they're making it up. It's not like they're weak. People have different pain thresholds. What do I do? Take your Celebrex, your Celecoxib, take the Tylenol. Each day it's gonna get better and each day it gets better. And I hold their hand and each day it gets better and they're fine, okay? Um, but the vast majority of people do fine without it. Uh, quick question is, do you have to get a physical from your, your primary first? So yes, so um, if I'm doing a facelift neck lift, whether it's in the office or at the hospital, the same rules apply. You have to see your primary beforehand. So the schedule is a month before the surgery, you see your primary. They'll do a note, an evaluation, they'll do EKG, and they'll do labs. So your blood count, your platelets, uh, your profiles, so they're gonna do how you, well, your blood clots. So all that gets done a month before. I see you two weeks before the surgery and I review your primary notes. So I look at the primaries, the medicines, allergies, the results of the labs, the results of the EKG, and we go through all of that. Um, uh, interestingly enough, every once in a while, something will come up on there and we have to delay a surgery. Oh, my sugars are high, they gotta figure this out or something. Um, something's going on and we have to delay things. But you always, whether it's in the office or at the hospital, you still have to see your primary. We see you two weeks beforehand, we go over that. We see you the day of the surgery. And then um, just for the post-op period, we see you the first day after the surgery, the second day after the surgery, the seventh day after the surgery, the 10th day. Then we see you a month and three months. Um, so that is sort of the structure for it, for the post-op periods. And the thing that you have to understand with the facelift is that I don't want you driving for that first week after the surgery. So you need to have someone to be able to drive you to the surgery and home the first day, the second day, and the seventh day. The 10th day you can drive yourself. Uh, quick questions. Question is how far are you booking out normally? Um, for a facelift neck lift, it's usually about uh, six weeks out. Um, depends on the season. Uh, my busiest season is between uh, right after Christmas all the way through April. So that gets booked out really very early. It's because the holidays are over, people are hiding, and I'll be doing one every like several a week. So that gets kind of crazy. As opposed to August when everyone's on vacation, it becomes, it gets a little easier to get in just because people are, are free. Um, if I have AFib that occurs under severe stress, can we do it in the office or surgery in the hospital? Ah, uh, that, so the question is if you have a medical disorder, um, that's up to your primary. We have to figure that out and that's just, that varies a lot. So, so sometimes people have medical conditions that prohibit you from having a facelift, right? So say someone's got really, really uh, a heart condition that's really kind of tenuous. Um, nobody needs a facelift. Right? Nobody needs a facelift. People want a facelift, but you don't need a facelift. And if you're at a cardiac risk, whether it's in the office or at the hospital, your cardiac situation's gotta be really cleared up because you don't, like, I don't need to do a facelift on someone who has got a bad heart. Um, but there's other conditions that prevent people from having surgery, and so that's part of what that primary note is. Um, when you wanna, uh, 
uh, when you want to do a facelift. Uh, so again, the question is medical conditions when you won't do a facelift. There's a variety of them. So say someone is on a um, anticoagulant. They're, they have blood clots, really a uh, history of blood clots. Or they have a really bad heart rhythm and they had a stroke and they have to be on a, on a co anticoagulant. Um, so again, it depends on their cardiologist or their primary. So if a cardiologist says to him, ah, you know what, you can come off your blood thinner for a week, it's not a big deal, that's perfectly fine, yeah, then I can do it. The cardiologist says, yeah, no, you're gonna, if you come off that, car, that blood thinner, you're gonna have a stroke, yeah, we're not doing a facelift. So there's, it, this, there are not many, but there's definitely a few things that, uh, specific things that would, would be a contraindication to doing a facelift. Um, what else? Uh, excuse me, I'll make a console. Okay. So the question is, how far before the surgery should I make a console? Ah, uh, so this is super, super, super important, um, especially because people will do facelifts before big events. Oh, my daughter's getting married, my son's getting married, I've got a reunion and I wanna do this. Um, you wanna do this, if you're considering doing, the console, doing a facelift, you wanna do that console months in advance. Um, for a variety of reasons. One is, um, A, it takes me a couple of weeks to get you in to see the console. Like, I can't see you tomorrow for a console. It takes, well, unfortunately, four to six weeks to do that. And then once I've seen you, then it takes like another four to six weeks to book the surgery. Um, so it takes time to see me, it takes time to get scheduled. So you have to book this way in, well in advance. Also, you need to have time to recover. Now, especially like with weddings, People don't think about this. Oh, oh, the wedding's in June. But then I've got a dress fitting and I got to meet the in-laws and I've got this meeting and I got that meeting. All of a sudden life gets really, really crazy and busy and I can't be bruised. I can't have a downtime. So you need to think about all those things that go into that process and you need to have enough downtime where you know, you know you're not going to have that facelift and next Saturday you're going to a, a, a dress fitting. Um, so you really have to think about it in advance. So the earlier, the better. Um, from our standpoint, you know, our consultation, like if I do a co cosmetic consultation, that fee's good for a year, right? So you don't have to, oh, I have to do it right beforehand. So the earlier, the better. Also, um, the earlier, the better is because then you can do the consult and we can talk about it and evaluate it and figure out what the best treatment option is. Because sometimes a facelift isn't the best thing for somebody. Some, a lot of times, you know, oh, I can get this done with filler, or I can get this done with a chemical peel. So you have other treatment options and it might not be a facelift. And so the earlier you do it, the better off, the better educated you're gonna be, the better you can make those decisions. And the other thing is I don't bite. Like people come in and they are, you know, for a consult and they're all nervous. They're like, oh my, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. I'm like, all we're doing is talking. Right? I'm not here to talk you into doing anything. I'm not here to force you into doing anything. I'm not here to sell it to you. All I'm here to do is educate you into what's going on, what the treatment options are, and then it's up to you to make the decision. So people are often hesitant to make a consult because they're scared, and it's just me talking, right? It's me asking you what's going on, finding, trying, and the most important thing is understanding your concerns. It's not my concerns. Right? It's not, you're not treating me. I am listening to your concerns, finding out what it is that bugs you, and then I'm telling you what your treatment options are. So it's really a very low stress type of a thing. Um, so don't worry about that. And what other questions? Are there certain, so, so that's pretty much all the questions. Um, any other questions? Like I didn't go over everything. Um, but um, again, we're at eight o'clock. It's gonna be just about eight o'clock. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you can email the office at um, uh, info at stanislawmd.com. Uh, the phone number for the office is 860-409-1515. Again, we're gonna keep doing these monthly. So this is like my monthly, it's gonna be all about so-and-so. So the next session is gonna, again, it's the second Thursday of the month at seven o'clock. The next session is gonna be on, I think, chemical peels. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about chemical peels. So we're gonna talk about chemical peels at the next session. If you guys have any topics that you wanna talk about, email those to us as well, and we can try to, you know, again, 
your input is really helpful. If you guys have questions, I love the questions, ask the questions, um, and we can try to answer them for you. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Paul Stanislaw. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for tuning into this. And again, hopefully we will see you uh, in a month uh, for another topic. And if you have friends, just let them know. All right, so thanks again, and you guys have a great night.